Now, I don't want to sound like some grumpy old man who's sitting on his porch barking at the cars going by, and we all know what that's like. But here it is. Sin makes life complicated and messy. It adds trouble and heartache that could have been avoided. And we see that truth played out all around us. As an example, think about some of the people that you know. Not yourself, of course, but other people that you know. (laughs) Who've blown themselves up. They've just blown their life up. And they didn't bring their life crashing down around them by doing honorable and right things. That's not what caused the disaster. It wasn't because they were obeying the word of God. They blew their life up because they weren't doing the right and honorable things in their life. They weren't obeying the word of God. Sin can appear to be fun when we're in the middle of it. But the paybacks can be rough. The consequences can be devastating. Today we're going to read about some people who do the right and honorable thing. And blessings will follow that for them. So far in the book of Ruth and our study through this book, a woman named Naomi from the town of Bethlehem in Israel moved to the foreign country of Moab with her husband and two sons to escape a famine. While in Moab, Naomi's husband and her two sons all died, leaving her alone in this foreign land except for her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth. Now, Naomi, she was able to convince Orpah to return to her own parents' home and begin to rebuild her life, but the other daughter-in-law, Ruth, refused to leave her. Ruth made a beautiful pledge of commitment to Naomi that has become famous. Many people have actually heard the words of this pledge of commitment. It's on little plaques and gift stores and on candles and all kinds of things. But they don't know where it actually came from, and it came from Ruth. Ruth 116, where Ruth said to Naomi, Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Well, Naomi received word that the famine had ended in Israel, so she and her daughter-in-law, Ruth, they returned to Naomi's hometown of Bethlehem. Naomi's name means pleasant. Delightful, lovely, which was a description of her character. But after the devastating loss of her husband and her two sons, having all that she cared about taken from her, when she got back to Bethlehem, she said to everyone, Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. There's no question that she had lived through an unimaginably difficult trial, but the Lord had not abandoned her. In reality, the Lord has provided Naomi with a very precious gift in her daughter-in-law, Ruth, a loyal and faithful friend. Recognizing that they needed food to survive, Ruth, she decided to go into the fields near Bethlehem and glean the left-behind grain. Unknowingly, the field that she went into happened to be owned by a man who was a blood relative of her and Naomi's deceased husbands. The man's name was was Boaz. Later that same day, as Boaz was checking on the progress of his workers, he noticed the young woman, Ruth, gleaning in his field. And when he learned who she was, that she was the Moabite woman who had returned to Bethlehem with Naomi, and that both of these women were widows of his relatives Elimelech and Malon. Boaz sought to provide them with some assistance. 
He gave his men instructions to make sure Ruth found as much left behind grain as she could possibly carry by purposely leaving behind generous amounts of grain stalks. He made sure that she was safe and cared for while gleaning in the fields. Well, when Ruth came home to Naomi with this big basket full of grain, Naomi asked her where she had been gleaning, realizing that the amount of grain she collected could only have been gotten if the owner of the field had taken a special interest in her. When Naomi realized that it was the field of Boaz, a blood relative of her deceased husband, she began to see that the Lord had not forgotten her after all. In fact, the Lord was looking out for her well-being and in the midst of all of her suffering in ways that she had never imagined, God was taking care of her. It was no accident that Ruth had happened upon the field of Boaz to do her gleaning. The Lord had led her to that field. Boaz is a guardian redeemer for Naomi and Ruth, and he has the means and the willingness to help them. Well, today in the story, we will learn that there's more than a basket full of grain in Naomi and Ruth's future with Boaz. Ruth chapter 3, if you haven't already made your way there. The first verse, it says, One day Ruth's mother-in-law Naomi said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. So one day, we aren't told how much time has passed between the end of chapter 2 and the beginning of chapter 3. Assuming Ruth started gleaning in Boaz's fields at the beginning of the harvest season, and now it's at the end of the harvest season, several weeks have probably passed between the two chapters. Naomi is concerned about Ruth's future. Ruth has been so kind to Naomi, caring for her. She feels the least she can do is try to get Ruth set up with a new life. You might remember that Ruth lost her husband, Naomi's son, Malon, while in Moab. When Ruth chose to accompany Naomi back to Israel, she left everything behind. Her family, her friends, her culture, her religion, that she had there, everything. The only thing that she has in Israel now is Naomi and her faith in the Lord. Naomi has been giving it a lot of thought over the past few weeks as she's watched things develop between Boaz and Ruth. It's obvious to her that Boaz has taken special notice of Ruth. But because he's much older than Ruth, And given the differences in their backgrounds, he's not allowed himself to entertain the idea of pursuing Ruth as a wife. Naomi, though, she has a plan for pushing things along in that direction. It was customary at that time for parents to arrange marriages for their children, and Naomi is stepping into that role in Ruth's life. Boaz is a relative of Naomi and Ruth by marriage. He is the blood relative of their deceased husbands. And there was a provision in the law of Moses that said if a man died without a son to carry on the family name and inherit the father's land, that a brother was to marry the wife of the deceased man and have a son on his behalf so the family name would be continued and the land would remain within the family of origin. Although the provision in the law stated that a brother of the deceased man was to take on this responsibility, it came to be understood within the Jewish community over time to mean the nearest relative of the deceased man. The Hebrew word translated brother can refer to those with a common ancestor rather than literally only one with common parents. So, this provision became a part of the role of the guardian redeemer in Israel. Now, although this law sounds odd for our day, this kind of thing is not done in our country, is it? At least, not that I'm aware of. But it was intended to accomplish two things in that culture and time. 
first to ensure that the inheritance land remained within the original family. The maintaining of the allotment of the promised land among the various families of Israel, it was extremely important for the Jewish people that it stay with those original families. The land represented God's promise and faithfulness to his people. Secondly, it was designed to protect childless widows. We've mentioned before that a woman who had lost her husband and then had no male children was in serious danger in those days. This law was a way to ensure that those widows had someone to take care of them. Well, based on what Naomi has observed in Boaz's treatment of Ruth, she believes that he will be willing to fulfill this responsibility of the guardian redeemer for their family, marrying Ruth, having a son on behalf of their deceased husbands. It's important to realize that what Naomi is doing here is not simply playing a matchmaker with Ruth and Boaz. She's concerned for Ruth's future. She wants to ensure that Ruth is well provided for and protected. She wants the family name to survive. She wants to make sure that their land stays within their family of origin. See, Naomi has not just gone about the town of Bethlehem to find a young, handsome, eligible bachelor for Ruth to marry. Instead, she sees that Boaz is a man who appears to be willing to fulfill the role of guardian redeemer for their family. He's a man of standing in the town, highly respected, established. He has a heart for the Lord. He is an obvious option for Naomi and Ruth to pursue. So the second half of verse 2 says, Tonight, she says to Ruth, he'll be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. The threshing floor was a level place of smooth rock or very compacted earth, usually located on top of a hill where grain could be separated from the shaft using a very highly developed, sophisticated, complicated method. They would literally just scoop it up and throw it up into the air and let the wind blow the shaft across and the grain kernels itself would then fall back to the ground. They still do it that way in some places in the world. Winnowing was usually done in the evening when the wind would be blowing most. Verse 3 she tells Ruth, wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. There are a couple of ideas that scholars have about why Naomi is instructing Ruth to wash, put on perfume, get dressed in her best clothes. Some think Naomi is obviously simply wanting Ruth to make herself as attractive as possible. Maybe. Others think Naomi is telling Ruth to remove her clothes of grieving as a widow, to let Boaz and others know that she's now ready to return to normal life, including considering marriage. See, it's believed that up to this point, Ruth has been wearing the garments of a widow in mourning. And Naomi is saying, okay, it's, it's time to complete that and move forward. Now, all of that could be true and may be true, and it all serves Naomi's overall objective here. Well, why will Boaz be sleeping at the threshing floor? Well, it's believed that he and others who were winnowing their grain like this, they would stay there at the threshing floor to watch over their grain against robbers and critters. And then after they were finished winnowing. The next morning, they would then take the grain and they would store it properly. Verse 4. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. 
Now, some have suggested that Naomi is instructing Ruth to do something improper here, to have physical relations with Boaz. And as tantalizing as that thought might be for some people, it's completely inconsistent with the story and the characters of these three people, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. All three of these people have demonstrated the utmost moral character throughout this story. To introduce an idea like that, that she is suggesting that she make some sexual advance to him in the middle of this story is beyond ridiculous and completely changes the character of the story. The most likely meaning here is simply what is described with the most obvious intention. Uncovering Boaz's feet would ensure that he will wake up in the cool of the night and then notice Ruth lying near his feet for them to have this private conversation that will ensue. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. So Ruth follows Naomi's instructions. She trusts Naomi's wisdom and insight here, even though there are some obvious risks involved in what she is being told to do. Verse 7, when Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. There are a few things that will make you sleep well more than a day of hard work outside where you are experiencing firsthand the goodness of God with a plentiful harvest and then a good meal. I mean, it makes your heart cheerful. Some want to portray Boaz here as drunk, passed out on the threshing floor. The Hebrew language doesn't suggest that. The Hebrew word here means to be cheerful, happy, pleased, content, not drunk. God has been good to Boaz. The drought is over. The harvest has been plentiful. There's more than enough reason here for Boaz to have a cheerful heart without having to be drunk. See, this is not a club scene with Ruth wearing a sexy little something coming on to a drunk Boaz. That is a complete mischaracterization of the story. Verse 8, in the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. I'm your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. So Ruth has done what Naomi instructed her to do. She stealthily sneaks up as Boaz is sleeping. She uncovers his feet and then she lies down and waits. He's startled awake. You can tell that someone is there near him. He asks who this is. She identifies herself as Ruth, and she says, spread the corner of your garment over me. She's not saying, can I share covers with you? That's not what she's saying. The same Hebrew word translated corner of your garment is translated wings in Ruth chapter 2, verse 12, where you might remember Boaz. He prayed that Ruth would find refuge under the wings of the Lord. There's a similar kind of meaning here. By asking Boaz to spread the corner of his garment over her, Ruth is requesting refuge and protection from Boaz. He's a guardian redeemer for her family. Ruth is asking Boaz to marry her without directly making a wedding proposal to him. In verse 10, we see that he gets it. He knows exactly what she means. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. He understands that she is asking him to marry her. 
Boaz is much older than Ruth, probably closer to Naomi's age rather than Ruth's age. He said he thinks he thought Ruth would seek out a much younger man for marriage and not concern herself with the provision of the Jewish law about the guardian redeemer for her deceased husband. Boaz is deeply moved by the faithfulness and the kindness that Ruth is showing to her deceased husband and also to him. I want us to consider something at this point. Boaz, he has the girl of his dreams really before him right now. And an unbelievable opportunity to take advantage of her and the situation. They're all alone in the dark. No one other than Naomi knows the Ruth is there. Obviously, he's attracted to her. She's in a very vulnerable position. What will he do? Will he take advantage of the situation, or will he prove to be a man of honor? Well, you can guess the answer. He's going to be a man of honor. Men, Today, I want to say to you, follow his example. Follow his example. Choose to be a person of honor. I mean, we're all aware of the Me Too movement that has filled our media for the last couple of years. And that all started as a response to men who didn't follow the example of Boaz. They were not men of honor. They took advantage of people, taking what was not theirs to take, and so on. We've all heard the stories. Do the right thing. Follow the example of Boaz. Be a man of honor and integrity. Don't take advantage of people. Don't bully people. Don't take what isn't yours. Protect the vulnerable and the weak. Use your strength and your position for good rather than selfish interests. Follow the example of Jesus in the way that you behave in all of your relationships. Verse 11, Boaz, he continues speaking to Ruth. He says, and now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Boaz enthusiastically accepts Ruth's proposal. He reassures her that he's going to do everything she's asked. And I want us to notice what he says about her. He says, all the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Boaz is not the only person who has established a good reputation The whole town knows Ruth as a woman of noble character. I I spoke to the men a moment ago about following the example of Boaz, and I want to also encourage you women to follow the example of Ruth. Be a woman of noble character. Do the right thing. Don't manipulate and take advantage of people. Live an honorable life. Follow the example of Jesus in the way You behave in all of your relationships. The two other places in the Old Testament where this phrase, noble character, are found are both in the book of Proverbs. And you might feel like the particulars of these scriptures are a bit out of date for your taste, but... I want to assure you that the character and the attitude behind these scriptures are certainly relevant for us. Proverbs 12, 4 says, A wife of noble character is her husband's crown, but a disgraceful wife is like decay in his bones. Proverbs 31.10, a wife of noble character, who can find? She's worth far more than rubies. Suggesting that it is a very rare find indeed. 
everyone, all of us. Let's pursue being people of noble character, people of honor and integrity, following the examples of Boaz and Ruth. Amen. Verse 12, he continues and he says, although it's true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there's another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good, let him redeem you. But if he's not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So Boaz, he's obviously excited, enthusiastic to do all that Ruth has asked, but there is one small issue here. He's not the nearest relative, he says. There is another man who has the first right of refusal in serving as the guardian redeemer for Ruth and Naomi. And the honorable thing for him to do is to give this man the first opportunity. He says, lie here until morning. I, I want to make sure... Once more, everyone is clear about the situation here because the first words of the next verse say, so she lay at his feet until morning. Ruth continues to lay at Boaz's feet, not beside him. They're not sleeping together. There is never any inappropriate behavior taking place between them. So she laid his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could, recognize, could be recognized. And he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He's concerned about their reputations. He also said, bring me the shawl you're wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to town. He's continuing to care for the needs of Ruth and Naomi, giving them this grain. This also serves as a sign, I think, for Naomi of his intentions and an an expression of gratitude, perhaps, for her hand in all of this. Finally, verse 16, when Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? And then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. She's a wise, insightful person, isn't she? She understands that it's now time for her and, and Ruth to wait and trust in the Lord and see what he will do. In closing this morning, we have mostly focused on Naomi and Ruth in our study of the book of Ruth up to this point. But today in closing, I want to focus our attention on Boaz for just a moment. His example of obedience to the word of God is noteworthy. We know through subtle and not so subtle suggestions that have been made in the story that Boaz has romantic interest in Ruth. He wants to marry her. There is no question about that. Naomi is not having to twist his arm. But he's going to give this other man who has the first right as guardian redeemer his opportunity first. And that must have been very difficult for Boaz to do. And he could have easily not made that opportunity available to this man. But Boaz is unwilling to disobey the word of God to get what he wants. Again, Boaz, he had the opportunity to take advantage of Ruth at the threshing floor that night. Oh, it would have been so easy for him to do whatever he wanted. He was in total control. But he didn't. He acted honorably. 
He's unwilling to disobey the word of God to get what he wants. How far are you and I willing to go with our obedience to the word of God? For many of us, as soon as obedience becomes inconvenient or its rewards appear to be too far in the future for us to, you know, really worry about in the moment, we quickly give in and we pitch the notion of obedience out the window. We say, oh, you know, I'll obey again tomorrow. But I'm going to do what I want right now. Can you imagine what the result would have been if Boaz had adopted that kind of attitude and behavior for himself that night at the threshing floor? See, it's it's not too outrageous to say that the whole world would have been affected by it. Because Boaz and Ruth are going to be the progenitors of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. They're part of the genetic lineage that leads to Jesus. Our obedience and disobedience, it affects the lives of more than just ourselves. It's a rare instance when our actions have no effect on anyone but ourselves. And let that be a motivator for us to obey the word of God. If pleasing our Heavenly Father is not motivation enough, do it for the sake of those that you love. Obedience to the word of God is important for a genuinely godly person. Oswald Chambers said, the best measure of spiritual life is not ecstasy, but obedience. Too often we measure the quality of our spiritual life in our own heads, and maybe even as we observe other people's lives, using feelings and experiences and wild God stories, ecstasies. But the Lord wants us to obey his word. He wants us to do what he says. That's how he measures the quality of our spiritual life. Because are you doing what I'm asking you to do? John 14, 21, Jesus said, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. We express our love for the Lord by obeying him. 1 John 2, 3, John writes, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Let's follow Boaz's example of obedience to the word of the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for the example of Boaz and Ruth in this story today. There are so few good examples in our world for us to follow and look to. We thank you that we have one here. People of integrity, people of courage, people of moral strength. Give us that same kind of courage and strength, Lord. We thank you for your love, for your commitment to us. We, and we ask, God, that you would help us to express our love and commitment to you by, by doing what you tell us to do. Bless each one here, Lord. 
Touch each one with your goodness, with your grace, with your mercy. We thank you so much, Father, for your mercy and your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen.